history for Aboriginal peoples is an interconnected set of ancient and sophisticated relationships. The University of Wollongong spreads across many interrelated Aboriginal countries that are bound by this sacred landscape, an intimate relationship with that landscape since creation. From Sydney, to the Southern Highlands, to the South Coast. From fresh water, to bitter water, to salt. From city, to urban, to rural. The University of Wollongong acknowledges the custodianship of the Aboriginal peoples of this place and space that has kept alive the relationships between all living things. The University acknowledges the devastating impact of colonisation on our campus's footprint. And commit ourselves to truth telling, healing and education. Yuendunyadi Temi, Gombanya, welcome to you all. Uh, I would like to welcome UOW alumni, staff, students, community, and we've got people zooming in here from all around. Uh, we've got New South Wales, ACT, Victoria, and Queensland. So thank you. Firstly, thank you for making time to, um, to come to our Zoom session today and, and listen to our journey here thus far at UOW. I'd like to start by acknowledging country. Uh, following that beautiful video that we've just released here at, at UOW. So um, I am on Yuan Nation of Darawal country, and I'd like to acknowledge that I am a Wiradjuri woman off country first and foremost, and I feel honoured and blessed to be living on this country. And never have I ever lived anywhere where I'm guided by country in, every day, in my everyday life. So I feel really lucky and blessed to be living here in the Wollongong area. I'd like to acknowledge uh, our elders of the past, present and emerging. I'm sure we have people in our audience today who are on the rise up uh, and, and leading in their places and spaces. So I'd like to acknowledge that contribution as well. I'd also like to acknowledge that we, are, that we are the most written about people in this world and not by ourselves, by the voices of others. So I'm very ex excited to, to be surrounded by other Aboriginal uh, and Torres Strait Islander people here today that we're going to be talking about and sharing our experiences of reconciliation with you. Uh, I'd also like you to pop in the chat if you want to shout out on whichever country you're zooming in from, whichever country or nation you're zooming in from. And I'd also like to just throw this out to Lane, one of our uh, panel members, to see if you might want to add anything um, to a, an acknowledgement. We want to discuss the importance of personalising your acknowledgement and, and making it feel like your own. Thanks, Tammy. Yeah. Um, evening, everyone. Uh, there's a bit going on at my house, so you, you could possibly hear a baby, you might hear a puppy, um, you might hear, hear a 12-year-old kid, <laughs> um, but we'll, uh, we'll see what we can do. Um, so yeah, I, I'd also like to acknowledge country and, and thank you, Tammy, for, um, for giving me the opportunity to, to acknowledge country as well. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that we stand on land that has uh, never been ceded, that, um, that has, you know, a, a deeper meaning and a, and a deeper layer of knowledge that uh, unfortunately for many, um, or many people I know, um, don't get the privilege and access to anymore. And what I'm talking about is the, um, the privilege of knowing your, your culture and your language and the knowledge of the, the language of the land. And particularly on this Southeast corner, I, I always say now that I speak from a Southeast New South Wales perspective. Um, I'm very mindful that the country that I, live and grow up on is very unique and very different to other people's countries. So I'd like to acknowledge the elders of the past and, and the elders of the present and the struggles um, and that, you know, the, the overlay of what we're, what we're currently sitting on is, is always, uh, always was and always has been Aboriginal land. We need to acknowledge that these buildings and these beautiful phones and these cars is just an overlay. It sits on top of what's already here. Um, it's already sits on top of what's already been here and has always been here. So 
um, as part of this acknowledgement, I'd like to encourage you to learn more about the language and the people and the mob and build relationships to where you are. So you can have your own personal uh, acknowledgement the country every day. Um, and some people already have that. They might go watch the sunrise every day. And that's connecting the country on your beautiful, beautiful area in which you live, because we're all part of this land now together. That needs to be a big part of it. We're going to talk about reconciliation tonight. And these white followers aren't going anywhere and neither are these black followers. So I acknowledge you all as well. It's nice to see some familiar faces here. Thank you so much. That was just beautiful. And I think I just imagine what our ancestors would have thought 235 years ago. Would they think that we would be sitting here leading a platform and, and having as many participants as we do now? And I just imagine how proud uh, they would be of us having voices and, and um, you know, being one of the oldest living cultures in the world and still living, living that culture every day. So thank you for that, Lane. I'd just like to introduce our panel members for you today as well this evening. So I've got Professor Bronwyn Carlson. Um, Professor Bronwyn Carlson is an Aboriginal woman who was born on and lives on Darawal country in New South Wales. She's the head of the Department of Indigenous Studies at Macquarie University, alumni of UOW, and Professor um, Carlson also taught at UOW for five, year, five and a half years. Her research interests include Indigenous engagement on digital platforms, Indigenous identities and Indigenous futurisms. Welcome. Thank you so much for being here, um, Professor Carlson. Thanks, Tammy. It's lovely to be here this evening. Thank you. Uh, we also have Ash Johnston. Ash Johnston is a First Nations Dungari woman currently living on sovereign Darawal country. She's an academic teaching and researching in the Indigenous space and an advocate for Indigenous survivors of domestic, family and sexual violence. Ash has worked on diverse projects involving um, advocacy, environmental sustainability, education, media, racism, language, performance, social media, domestic violence and COVID-19. She's currently completing a PhD with the University of Wollongong. Welcome, Ash. Thanks, Tammy. We have the lovely um, Lane, oh, Professor David Currow. Professor David Currow is the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Health and Sustainable, uh, Sustainable Futures here at UOW. He's a former Chief Cancer Officer New South Wales and the Chief Executive Officer of the Cancer Institute New South Wales, uh, the State Cancer Control Agency. David is the co-chair of our Reconcilia Reconciliation Action Plan Steering Committee as well. Uh, and David, we cannot thank you enough as well for, for uh, giving your time to us here this evening. Great to be here. Thanks, Tammy. <laughs> We also have with us, you would have mentioned, uh, met briefly, sorry, is Lane Brown. So Lane Brown is a proud Yuan man, currently working as Aboriginal Engagement Officer with Transport New South Wales. He is a UOW alumnus and Lane has previously worked here at UOW as a researcher with the, with the Australian Health uh, Service Research Institute and has partnered with UAW in his roles with AIM and the Illawarra Koori's Men's Support Group. So thank you so much for being here with us with us, Lane. And I'll tell you a bit about myself. My name is Tammy Small, a family name Gordon. I'm a Wiradjuri woman, as I mentioned, and I'm the manager of projects, um, a manager of projects Indigenous advancement here at UOW. We've just launched our wrap. You would, if you had the pleasure of being there with us, you would have seen that it was, it was done our ways and it was done very different. And we had the support of Lane and his dance group in order to, to make that happen for us. So uh, thank you. Thank you, everyone. And I just want to let you, all the participants know and everyone who's Zooming in this, this evening, that we do have some inter interactive activities. We, you'll see some slidos coming up uh, and we will get you to interact with them as we move through. If you also, if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in our Q&A. We will try and answer as many questions as we can, uh, but we assure you that we will get to some of the questions at a later date if we are unable to answer them all today. In the slider, you'll be asked for a passcode as well, and you'll see these, that information on the slide when we, when we get to that point. So I think, I think everyone's waiting. I think they're waiting for us to get started and ask these questions. So I'm gonna ask um, my first question to all our panelists and I'll say your name in accordance to who's on my screen, but this is for everyone, um, all panel members. And so my first question is, what does, reconcilia what does reconciliation mean to you? And what are your hopes for this new reconciliation action plan at UOW? 
So I can see um, Prof Carlson, uh, if I can get you potentially. Of course you can, Tammy. I was like, hmm, how do we answer this question? <laughs> so I, I feel like for a long time, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have been a bit disappointed with this concept of reconciliation. I feel it's something that even people who have come before us have strived for, and we've seen little outcomes that are benefit us um, in this generation, and of course, the younger panel members, members here today and this next generation. So for me, reconciliation would actually mean a, something that is done, and it's not done by us. And I think it's got to be a commitment from institutions to make institutional change. And that we don't often see. So there are beautiful documents. This is one of them as well. And I see the effort that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people make into these documents and into building reconciliation action plans. And they do that with hope for the future. They do that with a hope for something better for the next generation. And as somebody who started at Wollongong University back in, oh goodness me, 1999, when it used to be the Aboriginal Education Centre there supporting Indigenous students, and I started with Arnie Reader. Um, we're both kind of mature, well, Arnie Reader was a bit more mature than me, but we're both very mature age people. We went to university and it looked a lot different then to um, what it looks like now. But I can see that same struggle has just been generational. So for me, I'd like to see a lot of actions put beside reconciliation action plans that, uh, that there is somebody accountable to it, that it's measurable, and that community actually gets to hear how that, that has been achieved. Because I'm yet to, in all my long years and feeling very old on this cold winter night here on beautiful Daral country, to see an institution make such a commitment and then respond to the community and how they've met it. So for me, that's what reconciliation is. It's actions by institutions that are held accountable to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people whose country in which they are built on um, and who make real change for the future. So that's kind of like what I think reconciliation ought to be, should be. And that is my hope that some doing things come from this reconciliation action plan. And I'd like to be able to see that and know that's occurring. Thank you so much for the perfect answer. And of course, it's everybody's business. And let's hope that we, we do see some, some great change with our new RAP. Um, Professor Caro, uh, could I get you to answer that, this question as well? Uh, so what does it mean to you? And what are our hopes for our new action, our RAP? Well, that's, uh, that's pretty tough, Tammy, after Bronwyn uh, has answered it perfectly. What can you say? Um, I think there's, um, you know, at a macro level, uh, we want to see institutional change. Uh, and as we all realize, uh, whether that's about uh, reconciliation uh, or any other number of things that institutions should be doing far better than they are, it takes real time and commitment um, from everyone within the institution. And so uh, at a micro level, this is about relationships. And it's about building really genuine, trusting, respectful relationships between people. Because when we do that, then we can start to, uh, to really go down a path of, of genuine reconciliation that will see change and will see uh, that change sustained and gain momentum. But uh, it, it is about relationships, not just between institutions, but between people. And you and I uh, can, can build that bridge. I think one of the things that I took from the launch of the Reconciliation Action Plan, which is uh, incredibly obvious, but uh, you know, to which we don't give voice often enough is, this is not the responsibility of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to do the heavy lifting. Um, everyone needs to, to take uh, responsibility for that. And you know, we've got uh, some great, uh, Aboriginal communities uh, in the uh, the region around our campuses, not only in southeast New South Wales, but uh, but further afield. Um, this is not their problem, and uh, we need to make sure that uh, every person in this university, and in the communities in which they live, 
uh, is committed to real change, and that's through developing relationships. Thank you so much. Ash, what are your thoughts? I mean, what else is left to say after all, uh, both of those answers? Um, but I'll have a go. So first, just also acknowledging the sovereignty of the Darwal people whose lands I'm on here um, in the beautiful Illawarra. Um, I think, you know, exactly as has been said, reconciliation truly is just about non-Indigenous people and organisations listening um, to Indigenous people who are the experts on what we need um, and then following that up with authentic action. It's just about that genuine commitment um, to action to challenge those systems and frameworks because they do just continue to disproportionately affect Indigenous people in negative ways um, and just holding each other accountable as well to these promises. Um, you know, it's really easy to say um, that you want to, to make things better. It's really easy to say that you, um, you know, you are a champion of equality or, or whatever it might be, um, but it's about actually that accountability to those actions. And, and as, um, you know, Bronwyn was saying as well, like just looking back at those RAP promises and, and goals and seeing, you know, asking the community, have we actually achieved those things? So I think my hope for the new RAP is that room is made um, and significant resources allocated to those actions that have been outlined. Um, you know, I've, I've read the RAP and there are some really important goals that have been set out in it. Um, and I think, you know, if, if we can actually um, resource those and, and, and commit to doing them, we could actually see change happen in a really positive way, um, but it will take people across every level of the university to do so. Um, you know, there's there's just not enough Indigenous people to be able to make this happen. So we need to see every single level, you know, entry level all the way up committed to these actions. So I think that's probably my hope for it. Fantastic. And Lane, if you wanted to, to add anything but I just think it's really important to re reiterate what everyone's saying it's about coming together for country and for the importance of caring yeah. without jumping like there's a few questions there to unpack but um later on I don't want to get into that what you know because some of my feelings sit in there but um you know Dave was at the reconciliation action plan launch the other day and he um he, he would have been privy to my little talk I spoke for about 10 15 minutes about um what I what I thought um, and I'll summarise it here, um, you know, and it's, I'm going to touch on what Bronwyn spoke about, is, you know, our people have been fighting for this for a long time. Our, I'm going to try not to get emotional here. Um, you know, our, our elders have passed away. Our young ones are fighting and it feels, you know, they're 20, 30 years old and it feels like they've been fighting for the rights of their grandparents and of their people and they, they carry the weight and the burden and we're all getting tired and um, no offense to non-Indigenous people who are chipping in. Um, that's great. These aren't the majority. At the moment, we go to these forums and it's led by Aboriginal people. It's run by Aboriginal people. And it, it, it's really tiring. Everything that's got to do with Aboriginal people is led by Aboriginal people. And, and we're really, it, it, we're sick of the one-way dialogue. And um, uh, and I say we because there's a collective we, but this is my opinion. Um, we need to work together. Otherwise, what's the point? Um, is what we can't even hunt traditionally or live traditionally. We have to. We're forced to live in this other world, which in the Australian colony and government. And we have to play nice, and we have to play by their rules. And it'd be nice to get those worlds to meet a bit more, so we can have true reconciliation. Yeah, or we get rid of the word altogether, maybe. But yeah, Bronwyn can write a paper about it. <laughs> well, thank you so much. What a great way to start off this panel discussion. So I, I, next, what we're going to do, our a Slido. Just We've got a couple of, uh, one question for you on Slido. And I just want to thank everybody who sung out on which countries they are from. So you'll see in the chat and We've got our screen shared at the moment. We have our, our Slido for you. And the question is, so what words would you use to describe your feelings of reconciliation? We just thought we'd, we'd gather some responses here today and we understand the, the variances that we might receive as well. 
And I'd just like to thank the alumni team for all their help in uh, putting this together with myself and the Indigenous Strategy Unit to make this possible for you tonight. So we just use a passcode and get in and chuck in a word or a couple of words for reconciliation. It could be excited. It could be anyone else from the panel want to chuck out some words as well. It could be um, contentious. Uh, it could be change, hopeful. What else? What else can we think of that people might might think for the words they feel about reconciliation? What have we got? We've got excited, support, hope, daunting. It is a daunting experience. There's so much work to be done. Much has been achieved since the birth of the formal process of reconciliation in 1991, but we still have such a long way to go. Um, you know, there's so much work overdue, optimistic, communication, transformative, relationship, deeper understanding, loving this, overdue, what a unity, hard work and exhausting for, for black people. Yes, definitely. As Lane has mentioned before, we've been leading these conversations and our ancestors worked hard uh, to, for their plight for social and political equality for us to even be in these spaces today. Lovely, we're still coming. We've got connection, joy, overdue together. Nervous about getting it right. Look, there is a whole when in doubt, leave it out situation, but I think sometimes that's why we might be in the positions that we are today, um, especially in the in the classrooms. I think there's a lot of when in doubt, leave it out. And then we, we, we see the impact coming here when we have our students. Accountability, action, relief, finally. <laughs> Excellent, knowledge seeking. Lovely. Well, thank you so much for contributing to that. And I will move into the next round of questions. And Ash, I have a question for you. And, you know, the, the State of Reconciliation report in 2021 20, discusses uh, the Uluru Statement from the Heart, and it discusses the institutions coming together and organisations and building uh, businesses really using this uh, within their areas. So I have a question for you around you know, a significant part of our reconciliation journey here at URW and for many is truth telling. How does this relate to the Uluru Statement of the Heart and what could this mean for our university? Hard one, Ash. <laughs> I mean, you know, I think this is uh, something I could probably speak about for hours, but I'll try and keep it brief and just give me a, single, a signal if I need to wrap it up. Um, but look, I think truth telling is is one of those really key parts of reconciliation. Um, and it's not just for Australia on that national level of reconciliation, um, but for anyone who wants to be a part of that process of achieving equality and justice. Um, you know, I'm a lecturer here at, at the uni as well. Um, and one of the things that students always um, bring up throughout the semester is this kind of sadness and um, anger that they didn't know about this history, um, that they've gone through 12 years of education, um, have come into a university course and, and now, you know, as young adults are, are starting to learn about this stuff. So it's, you know, it's something that people, people want this, they want to know um, what the history is, they want to know what has happened. And so the Uluru Statement, it calls for Makarata, which is the coming together after a struggle and it asks for a commission to kind of supervise this process of either agreement making between governments and First Nations people um, but also that truth telling about our history. It's you can't have agreements made, you can't have justice and equality and all of those things without also having truth telling um, and one of the things within the statement that that they speak to it's almost like this this prophecy they call to it that's filled with hope that says we seek constitutional reforms to empower our people and take a rightful place in our own country because this is our country um, and we need to be able to take our place in this country. It says we have power, when we have power over our destiny, our children will flourish, they will walk in two worlds and their culture will be a gift to the country. So, you know, we have this history, we have this knowledge and that is such a beautiful, powerful gift that we are here and ready to, to share, you know, 
know, with the rest of Australia. Um, so I think, you know, for me, this process of truth telling is just so vital if we are ever going to reach that point, if we are ever going to be able to come together and heal. Um, and if we don't talk openly and honestly about the history of this country, um, but also the contemporary situation that we find ourselves in now, we just damn ourselves essentially to staying in this really uncomfortable place of inaction and inequality. And so I think if you apply that, that call to action of truth telling to a university setting, I think that it can mean asking everybody here at the uni um, in whatever position you're in to just hold space open for us so that we can speak for ourselves, um, to never speak for us and instead just have that strength to take brave action, um, which will make people uncomfortable, um, but it's important. You know, you have to be able to take those, those really brave, strong actions to see real change. And I know that like these conversations about reconciliation and sovereignty, um, you know, they make a lot of people feel very overwhelmed about where do you even start. Um, but I just want to always remind everyone, and I say this to students all the time and to everyone here tonight, you know, every single person actually has that power to be a true ally. And it's not just about your own attitudes, but also in your advocacy and your support for Indigenous peoples. You know, look around your Ourselves. Like it, if your organisation doesn't engage with Indigenous people, you can just ask why not. If your project doesn't have Indigenous people informing it and guiding you, you have the responsibility to ask why not. You know, if your service doesn't have Indigenous employees, not just in that entry level position, but also way up at the top and in the boardroom, it's actually your responsibility and your privilege to demand, you know, why not. And so we have these words around like collaboration, community led, reconciliation, sovereignty. Um, and these aren't just token words to be brought out, you know, once a year during Reconciliation Week. They're actually those fundamental cornerstones for achieving equality and justice. You know, First Nations people are ready to tell our truth. We have been speaking this truth for a long time. Reconciliation and truth telling essentially asks the rest of Australia, are you ready to listen? And if you are, are you ready to act as well? So I think, you know, it's it's that power to act by knowing the truth and then acting upon it. Thank you so much for that, Ash, and I'm sure our um, participants can, can take a, a bit away from that as well, which leads us into the theme, doesn't it, for this year's National Reconciliation Week, which is Be Brave and Make Change, and we are hosting this the week before, so very much uh, cognizant of that, uh, aware and cognizant of that here at UOW. But you've mentioned something really beautiful, which I'm going to pass on and I'm going to ask um, Professor Bronwyn Carlson a question around uh, something that you've, you've mentioned as well, Ash. So our inaugural wrap noted that although the university offers a range of um, Aboriginal based subjects and co courses, students can complete their courses and degrees without encountering any content perspective. What could we do to address this? It's a really good question, Tammy, and it does follow on a lot from what Ash has just explained. So reconciliation action plans are about accountability, right? It's the university is accountable to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in the community in which they um, get the pleasure of having their buildings on and work on and um, benefit significantly from. And so that accountability actually has you know, some elements to it that are required. So we have to ask ourselves, an institution such as UOW, main priority is educating the future, educating young people to go forth and be um, decent and um, humans who want a different world to live in, one that's better. I mean, we should always be thriving for some, like striving for something that is better. And so institutions have the obligation to educate the future. How is it that you have a rap, yet somebody can be educated at your institution and walk away with no knowledge of anything to do with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people? And so this is also about investment, right? So just a little bit from when I was there, and I know things may have changed, and I'm really hopeful that they have. But when I was there, institution committed to funding from things like the Ramsey Center, whilst Indigenous studies as a discipline was in demise. 
How does that happen? So Indigenous studies is a, is a proper discipline that has a disciplinary focus that spends a great deal of time educating non-Indigenous people. So where's the investment from institutions into Indigenous studies? And that would require Indigenous scholars who then produce scholarship that educates the masses. Where's that investment? So for me, that's how institutions do it. So you can't possibly think that students could come to your institution no matter what discipline they choose to study and have no Indigenous content. So there's been a lot of talk for a lot of time around embedding Indigenous perspectives into curriculum and all this kind of stuff. And there's been no real investment in doing that beyond the, the level of cultural awareness training. So it sticks at this level, right? So how is it actually privileging Indigenous knowledges and educating people on an alternate way to view the world or to challenge their own worldview in which they hold. So it doesn't do that. Cultural awareness training says, be nice to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people that you might encounter and don't be openly racist. And so indigenous people are then charged with teaching them what an acknowledgement to country is, what a welcome to country is, and what are the colors of the flag. And they go forth and have no change behavior. So there really needs to be a great deal of work around anti-racism training for people, because I can tell you right now, people who know the color of the flag and how to do an acknowledgement of the country doesn't necessarily mean they don't hold racist views. And so if they do not, as part of their education spectrum, learn anything about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people other than viewing us as some sort of problem, some sort of something that they can fix, then there's a real issue. And so institutions really need to think about how are they ensuring that they are they have a good solid number of indigenous scholars along with their support staff that they are focused on indigenous students and where is the commitment to local areas like i remember when i was there i suggested that we have a local unit or a, a local subject that we teach that is embedded in Darawal and wadi wadi people's knowledges and systems so that would be a unit of study that would be developed by local people where's that commitment that is something institutions could do and so I'm not talking about cultural awareness training. I think for how many years now has cultural awareness training been around and made absolutely no difference to the lives of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people? I would be very surprised to hear if either Lane or Ash or yourselves had no experiences of racism or discrimination in the institution. I would be really surprised to hear that you floated through those institutions without ever having to think to yourself, holy shit, that was racist. Holy shit, why am I putting up with that? I reckon that you'd be greatly challenged to say, this has all been roses for me. So these things need to happen and they need to change pretty quickly. We need to move beyond cultural awareness. We need to hold institutions accountable. There's no way you should be able to complete a degree with no indigenous content. That is ludicrous in this country where Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are the first peoples of this place who are the knowledge holders of this place, yet have no input into the curriculum that's taught to people. So people walk out of there and it has real world implications, right? I had this student who once said to me, oh, I feel really embarrassed. I've been in charge of this employment office where I sort out who gets offered what jobs. And I've always determined who's Aboriginal based on whether they've come from some sort of community outside of urban settings. And after doing Indigenous studies, I realized how racist that was. So at every single level, and that person was in business, every single discipline, people need to have a better understanding, or at least some understanding of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, cultures, and the histories of this country, because it's not being taught. You cannot rely on settlers to teach it. Indigenous scholars need to be employed. They need to be supported. They need to be able to conduct research and to provide scholarship. And nobody should get out of those doors without having done some Indigenous content. And that's not to say that people will leave um, and be suddenly anti-racist. I'm not that much of a utopian thinker, but it certainly is a start. Wow, thank you so much uh, for that answer. And we do have some points and actions and deliverables in our new wrap that may help us overcome, and we're very hopeful hopeful of that. Um, but we'll be working very hard in order, as a collective, I assure you, <laughs> in order to, to make that happen. David, uh, Professor David Currow, let's... I've got a question for you. So what are the big goals in our new app or what are some of our big goals in our new app that inspire you in your leadership role? 
here at UAW. Thanks, Tammy. Um, in, in following on from Bronwyn's um, really important uh, um, thoughts, I, I think the, the, the RAP is uh, a great roadmap for us as an institution to actually change. And I, I know that challenge was put out there right at the beginning by Bronwyn, and uh, I couldn't agree more strongly. Institutions need to change, but they will only change uh, if we can work with the people in them. They are not uh, a, amorphous uh, um, uh, structures that, uh, that, that are anything more than driven by the people and the values of those people uh, within the organization. I, I want to put out a very bold challenge this evening. Uh, I think uh, one of our real challenges um, as we think about uh, scholarship particularly, and uh, I, I love uh, Bronwyn highlighting uh, the issue of scholarship there, is to ensure that we have a, a critical mass. And I, I wonder, and this is the bold challenge, uh, whether that critical mass actually needs to be focused in a few places of higher education to really consolidate it. Uh, in order to then populate uh, all of higher education. And I think there is a challenge in trying to grow this in every institution uh, at, at every step and at every level of uh, academic, professional and uh, uh, student uh, life. Um, to that end, I really would like to work with uh, the community to make the University of Wollongong a, a genuine, um, place that uh, is uh, the preferred provider to, to many people from around the country to create that critical mass that, that can then uh, really help uh, institutions where this has not been um, taken up. Uh, and, and I absolutely take Roman's point, but I think uh, the university is working to, uh, to change. Um, and I, I see some fellow institutions where that's probably happening a little more slowly uh, and with a little less focus. So how do we create that momentum uh, and ensure that that momentum is actually generated in every place of higher education? And we think of that uh, in terms of universities. I also put out the challenge that we need to think about technical and further education uh, in exactly the same way that Bronwyn has outlined. How can people uh, have uh, any sort of post-school um, education without that, uh, that opportunity? Thank you. Thanks so much for, for those challenges as well. And, and, and you're right, we are working incredibly hard and here at UOW and we have a lot of momentum. So it's about keeping that, that um, continuing discussion and um, that traction that we're receiving at the moment. I'm now going to throw over to Lane. Uh, Lane, if, if UOW is successful on our reconciliation journey, what could this look like for our communities within our campus footprints? Yeah, I, I think um, it looks like access. It, you know, these, these campuses are beautiful and in beautiful places and quite unique. You go to Nara um, and you go, oh, you know, this is a small little university campus, but there's not much like that in Nara, that campus itself. You know, our, our community need access to the land. They need access to those rooms. They need access to the employment. They need a connection. At the moment, there's not a true connection. So if there's a reconciliation action plan that is authentic, it's got to demonstrate that. It's got to walk the talk. It's got to talk the walk. And if it's um, not talking or not walking, it's got to be moving towards that. You know, I've got to come back to access every time. When we, talk, when we say university, our mob, Aboriginal people should go, oh, that's a weird, strange word and a funny place. And why would you go there? Well, you know, access could be really easy. And, um, you know, uh, if you want to run a, a, an event at the university, and I've been going to the university since I started in 2005. I went there as a year 12 student to apply to go into the, into the alternative admissions program. So I've been walking the halls there since 2005. 
And every year new people come into that university, Aboriginal people. The majority of those Aboriginal people are not from this community. They're not from here. Our local people aren't accessing. I'm not talking about traditional owners. I'm talking about kids that finish school. They don't see the university as a place that they can go to. It needs to be a place that they can go to. And it starts off with one stepping foot on this, on this campus, on the V campuses all along the coast. And it's as simple as this. So I said, oh, let's do a, a community day or a NAIDOC day or, or pick a significant event. We'll shut down the campus, free parking for all the mob. There's no excuse. We'll get them a free bus ticket. We'll get them a free train ticket. Whatever we need to do to get them in and access to say, hey, this is a place for you. Because the more people you get in the door, I, I was going to look up the stat before this meeting, but I, I, I thought maybe I'll, I'll, I'll just stick a little bit clear. But the stats of non-Indigenous people going to university is so disproportionate. So the average pun that goes to university used to be about, I think, a third of people went to tertiary education after they finished school, um, maybe just over. There's something like 30 to 40%, whether it was TAFE or university, something. They went to tertiary, right? Aboriginal people, I, I didn't look it up because I didn't want to see how sad it is. But um, that's, that's a start. There got to be jobs. I, I, I walked around the campus the other day and I saw a young girl there that I've known her family for years and she was a gardener. And it just made my heart smile. And that needs to be everywhere I go on campus. We need that access. It, that, that, is our, that, is, that is our community's place. It's not the university. That was our mob's place. That was our land. And that was taken. So by having access, you're acknowledging that. By having our Aboriginal people work there, play there, study there, it, it's, it's got to be the way. Let them into the gym for free, for crying out loud. Has anyone looked how much a gym membership is? We've had that gym for so long. There's so many ways we could access that place. Yeah. Fantastic ideas. Love the enthusiasm as always, um, Lane. Would anyone else like to, to add to that? I wasn't going to open it up, but I thought it's, it's a really good question. Um, you know, and if we are successful, what could it look like for our communities? But I'm, I'm happy if anyone else in our um, panel wants to add. No, I really like that response because it is about material benefit, right? So how are these institutions? And I am talking about the people in them, um, David, most definitely. How is it that they're focused on material benefit for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in this place in which they benefit from so greatly? I mean, I really resonate with that story. I, I was doing family research stuff when um, Glenn Williams was there as a student support officer and said, oh, why don't you come on campus to have a look through the old photos? So, And I was, I'd never been to a university in my life. Nobody in my family had been to university. I don't even think I ever said university as a word in my life. So going there made all the difference, coming on campus and, and um, feeling like you were part of that community was, you know, a wonderful experience. And, you know, you get results when you invest in um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, without a doubt. When I think about the alumni that I know from UOW, you've got a range of people, you know, who are working in community, who are working in organisations, who are now professors or scholars. Um, you know, that's all just lost knowledge to UOW when they leave. It is lost, you know. Um, so I think doing a little bit better about keeping people and growing your own is a really good strategy. I mean, you've got a young scholar like Ash. What's, you know, what's the plan? I don't know, Ash, I'm just throwing you under the bus right here. What is the plan to ensure a future for this young scholar to complete their PhD, to go on and be an awesome researcher and provide brilliant scholarship to the community? Where's the investment in that? I'm, I'm pretty sure I'd be safe to say there probably isn't any. Um, I look at the demise of Indigenous studies um, in many places around the country, not just UAW, and think, well, that's a great loss. I mean, I mean, there used to be, um, I don't know if you even remember this, um, Lane or even Ash, like universities used to offer block programs to community for, you know, to develop skills. Um, and that often led to doing degrees at the institution and it led to a relationship and connection with the institution. I remember Indigenous Health at UOW used to offer those kind of block programs to bring communities in right from right across Western New South Wales and further afar. And a lot of those people went on to do medical degrees, et cetera. So yeah, it really is about investment. It's about a material benefit for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And reconciliation action plans, I'm like really 
cautiously optimistic that they might produce that, but I haven't seen any evidence yet um, to see that. I've seen um, various reconciliation plans get revamped. And I think, what's this one coming under the idea of courageous? Is that courageous for us to keep up the, keep, keep going? Or is that courageous for settler folk to do something? I'm not sure what the courageous bit is about. Um, but, you know, for me, it is all about material benefit. And it is seeing Indigenous people employed. It is seeing that their lives change, having the opportunity to be educated without feeling like they don't really meet the grade. I mean, that's why places like, you know, WIC, Younger, the old Aboriginal Education Centre, all of those kind of um, ways that places transformed are terribly important. Uh, I think each and every one of us had come through um, and been supported by such support centres. So they're really um, beneficial as well. Um, but yeah, material benefit, that's definitely the bottom line for it all. Thank you. And I can assure you that we are working very hard on, on staff pipelines and, and Jamie Beveridge, who heads our Indigenous Strategy Unit, it's at the forefront of her mind and, and there are set wrap deliverables that discuss uh, direct appointment for HDR students into academic contracts. So we're, we're very much, very much, um, you know, looking at the pipeline, but I, I completely agree with I'd you. I'd like to see a, a few more professors, actually, because it's the leadership that's lacking in that higher um, space. I know I've worked at institutions when there's a lack of Indigenous professors who actually can speak at that kind of level, particularly around developing strategies and making change at institutions. And as much as we'd love to think that they're listening to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, they listen to people with titles. And so I think it's really important for us mob to be sitting at those tables. Could not agree with you more. Um, be sure, make sure you shout out and ask any questions that you might have. I can see a few coming through, which are fantastic. And we'll be sure to get to them uh, at the end of the session if, if we can. Or like I said earlier, we'll definitely answer these questions for you um, following this session. We've got a couple more, a few more questions to go. Um, I'd like to throw this out to a couple of people. And, and this is an alumni question. So how can alumni support the reconciliation journey at UOW and beyond? Lane, can I get your thoughts as an as a alumni of UOW first? Yeah, I, I think um, they, you need to first and foremost be uh, mindful and present in terms of what reconciliation is and what I, what I mean by, um, sorry, Poppy's having a, fair go here hey hold on what i mean by that is <sighs> hello doggy um what i mean by that is by first of all whenever you go to a space for an organization as an alumni go where's the mob who's the mob where where are they at you know who's my local elder um who's my community groups how are they involved? Do we work with them? Do we have an existing relationship? And yeah, you might um, work at a distribution company, right? In sales. And you might go, well, how does that, um, how does that relate to me in terms of reconciliation? Or have you got really low skill labor that Aboriginal people could be doing and easy access for that they don't need a degree? There's good employment opportunities there. And they, then maybe later on, they might go on. But we're talking about when we're talking about breaking down um, low SES issues in this country, they, that's what true reconciliation is about. Um, I've got some really, um, really good, like men my age, Aboriginal men, and they got trades nice and early, and that changed the trajectory of their lives. Having meaningful employment, so you can look around. It, it can say, "Oh, wait, hold up. We actually work with the community, but we don't know any of the Aboriginal community that we live in." Or, oh, we just call up Uncle Such and Such. And, um, but is outside of Uncle Such and Such coming in at NAIDOC time, when else do you talk to him? Does he drop in? Is it a place that he's comfortable? Um, you know, all that sorts of things is that, yeah, that meaningful relationship. So that, that would be my starting point really for alumni is if you're actually interested in changing this country for the better, we're talking about changing all the time now. There's bloody people talking about changing and they're going to make us vote on it on the weekend. But if you want true change, you can. it comes in your own collective action and the people around you. And you, it's, it's got to be on people to go, hold on a second, this isn't right. That's not right. You know, where's the Aboriginal people? Where's the mob? 
we need to get them involved. We, we can't make you do that. Like I said at the start, Aboriginal people are tired. We, we, we can't come to you and go, oh, have you heard about the Daryl people that live in the Wollongong area? Um, it, it's not on us anymore. It's on you guys. So, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Lane. And Ash, you touched on this a little bit earlier with, you know, everybody has a part to play. Um, is there anything you wanted to add about how can alumni support this journey? Uh, or support the reconciliation journey? Yeah, I think, you know, just echoing um, what Lane was saying there, like if, you've, if you're in an organisation where you, you only interact with Indigenous people during that, you know, NAIDOC week or Reconciliation Week and the rest of the year there's no involvement, that's a really good indication that you're not actually um, doing much. That's like a really good indication that you're not actually an ally for reconciliation. Um, you need to be having consultation with Indigenous people throughout the year. Um, and it does not matter what your organisation does. It does not matter what job you do. There is not a single industry or employer or organisation in this country that is um, immune to needing to understand things um, for Indigenous Australians because we also live here so we access everything we access transport health education we buy bath bombs and we get our hair cut like there is not a single thing that we don't participate in in this country so no matter what it is that you do you know as an alumni you have the ability to actually implement um, consultation with Indigenous people and make your space um, open and inviting and I think also um, as alumni you know you have a really powerful voice as a network um, if you see the university um, doing things that you think it should do differently you can actually use that collective voice as alumni to send that feedback back to the university as well um, there's a really strong tie between UAW alumni and the university you know events like this events throughout the year so as a collective as well you actually hold quite a lot of power to feed back into the university um, and to advocate for those things that indigenous communities are calling for as well Thank you so much. Um, Professor Carlson, would you like to add anything about how alumni can support the journey? I just thought I'd chuck it out to our alumni. Oh, I, yeah. I've always got something to say, Tammy. <laughs> Look, I don't think institutions in um, Australia have really um, maintained networks of their alumni very well um, for a long time. Well, particularly not us mob anyway. Um, so I think that that's something institutions can do better because like I said before, you have you bring people through the doors, they go through this, you know, spend years, um, you know, in these institutions connecting with people and then you're off out in the world and you, you know, work in professions, um, you're generally a well-educated person, so you're working in the, you know, making uh, decision-making professions, etc. And so bringing all that knowledge back into, and, you know, and treating alumni um, as this kind of bank of valued knowledge holders, um, I think is really wonderful. But to what Lane's point as well is, a lot of institutions now have um, elders in residence, um, which are paid positions for elders to advise on significant issues around strategies and stuff. And these things are really wonderful. Um, and I think about some of the local mob here who, who would just value add so much. Um, but yeah, having a, a, a network. So what does it mean to be alumni of, of Wollongong? You know, I, I was, it is about relationships for me because, you know, Jamie asked me, and so I went to uni with Jamie. Um, and so that's how it operates. But what about people who are outside of our own personal kind of networks who went through these institutions before me, after me, beyond me and all the rest of it? Where are those people? Um, and so, yeah, really um, spending a lot of time and institutions have done this sort of in an ad hoc way and building up their alumni network, but they're really undervalued um, because people bring back to the institutions they care about. So why, this is the question that UAW needs to ask themselves, why would our alumni care about us? Why should they? And so when you can answer that to me, to Ash, to Lane, to the community, then that's when you've got your answer. So why, why would we care about this place? Obviously, you know, for lots of people, it's on country. And whilst, you know, my family originate from South Australia, I was born here. I have um, connection to this place and care for it and people here. Um, so yeah, why, why should we give our time and energy to an institution? What is it that the institution is doing to make us proud? Why do I want to wear a UAW shirt? Why would I do that? Like, that's what they need to ask themselves. So, you know, what is it that they've done for the alumni to keep alumni connected, to build capacity in this place? 
in Water Mighty Challenge, you've given our alumni team, and I'm sure they'll be typing some notes now and they'll get back to me straight away following this and saying, Tammy, I assure you we are doing this. Can you please pass this on? <laughs> um, and we have a, a pretty solid uh, Indigenous alumni here. And, you know, as you may know, we've got a, a dinner tomorrow night as well with our Indigenous alumni coming from uh, another university, not from this one. I, I don't have any connections with my, as an alumnus of my old uni. And I see some things happening in this space and I get really excited about it. But I think you're right. There's many questions still to be answered. Um, David, could I just ask you a question on... Um, how can philanthropic support assist in terms of, um, in, if we're talking about alumni support, in terms of a, a philanthropic avenue? Uh, money always welcome, Tammy. Um, look, there are lots of uh, philanthropists who uh, uh, have a particular uh, interest in really supporting uh, people from uh, uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander backgrounds. I, I think uh, to take Bronwyn's point, uh, if we're going to grow uh, the, the uh, uh, core of scholars, um, then we, we need investment to break cycles. Uh, first in family uh, to university is, is absolutely critical and that doesn't just happen. Um, I, I think the, the other aspect of that is, um, uh, you know, the, the transition particularly to uh, uh, to master's or doctoral studies and, and then to postdocs, um, anything that is going to uh, provide greater certainty in those pathways is absolutely critical to the future. And, uh, you know, part of uh, uh, our team's efforts in working with philanthropists is uh, ensuring that they're thinking broadly about how uh, they invest their money. I think the, the other aspect is that philanthropists themselves have changed in uh, uh, progressively over the last half century in Australia. They now want far more than ever before, I think, uh, relationship uh, with uh, the investment that they're making. It's not a grant. They, they actually want to see um, the benefits that are accruing because they've put their money on the table. Um, I, I honestly believe that uh, we can grow that area of giving uh, in ways that can really help to accelerate rapidly uh, the, um, uh, the, the graduation of, uh, of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander uh, uh, academics uh, that really can uh, take their place right across Australia uh, and ensure that uh, as people come to universities, they are, uh, they are going to predictably um, experience uh, gaining knowledge that they otherwise would not have had. Thank you so much. Um, and yeah, valuable opportunities to be, to be had for everyone there, I think. We're going to go through with another Slido. We've got another poll, another open poll. And here we want to hear from you, uh, our participants here. How could the university support you on your reconciliation journey? Um, yeah, and what, what's some, what's, what would you like to support with potentially in your workplace? Or, um, yeah, just what would, you, what would you like us to help you with whilst you're on your journey? Could be at work. It could be at home in your everyday lives. We've got transparency. Okay, that's that great point. Yeah, so we've got UOW staff member would love to commit to anti-racism training. Thanks, Prof Carlson. We'll have to get onto that one, won't we? <laughs> we do have a, a access core program that we have um, purchased for staff and will be rolling out to students uh, throughout the next year or so. Um, but I don't believe it has a whole great deal on anti-racism or anything really local at that. More education, intentional action. Um, they'd like to, someone has mentioned they'd like to attend events, workshops and webinars about Indigenous histories and culture. Traditional workshops. So just general more training and more education in this space. I want to learn about the Darawalt history and culture. I mean, wouldn't that be fantastic if we had a book written about our campus and what was occurring here prior to all the buildings and, and around whose traditional lands. Education and accountability. Sharing. 
build Indigenous studies, cultural humility training, agree, and we're, we're very much working on this and we are adding local perspectives, strengthening existing relationships. What about, is there anything in terms of cultural cooking classes? Yes, so these are, you know, things that we, we might be able to as well support with and it, it could be things in terms of cultural safety resources and I guess that came with the cultural hum humility training as well. Ethics of passing on information in our workplaces, more open dialogue like tonight's event. Um, wow, thank you so much. We've still got three participants, five participants typing for, so I'll wait a few seconds. Fund Indigenous Studies at UOW so we can become a centre of Indigenous research and ex excellence. Email Ash to talk more. Ash, love that. Yes, reach out really, really interested in that and, and be sure to, to reach out. Empathy, uh, pathways to connection, visible Indigenous language around campus. Love this idea. I think it's fantastic. And I was only talking to facilities management division about this last week, but we need to do it the right way and not just add things and, and for the sake of adding. Commit with um, money, not just words. Completely agree. And, and I, I believe that was discussed quite a bit in, in some of our questions that we've had. Wow, they were, they were fantastic. Thank you so much to everyone who contributed and our alumni team will gather all that information and see what we may already have to support you on your reconciliation journey or some of the new things that we'll be developing through our wrap and how we might be able to share those uh, resources with alumnus as well. So I have a question I'm gonna chuck out. I'm gonna have another question for you, Professor David Curro. And it is, just in that poll, for example, so we've got that we had the poll. Um, is there anything else that you can think of how um, that UOW is able to do to support alumni on their journey? So if we look at the poll, I, I think there's uh, both education and experiences that, uh, that people have highlighted really uh, uh, incredibly in uh, the things that can help them to better understand Indigenous culture. Uh, the focus on local is, uh, is critical uh, uh, in that. Um, we need to amplify rapidly uh, the opportunity for uh, ex experiences, excuse the dog, uh, experiences across uh, uh, a, a, a range of uh, opportunities um, for staff, for students. Um, and excuse me for one second. Shh. Thank you. Um, uh, across staff and students uh, throughout their time uh, at the university and uh, their formal opportunities, but we, we've got to create more informal opportunities too, uh, where people really can uh, gain experiences that they otherwise wouldn't have. And I think, you know, one of the great things of universities is to offer people opportunities that they otherwise would not have. And they, they can be encounters with uh, uh, cultural uh, elders who are prepared to sit down and, uh, and provide um, education to the most uneducated people who have not encountered this uh, in their life before coming to, uh, to university. Um, and let's face it, uh, despite lots of policies that are trying to drive universities in the opposite direction, education is not about uh, uh, the letters you have after your name. It is actually about uh, uh, the skills, insights and uh, ethos that you take into the world and continue uh, across your life to, uh, to develop and refine. Lovely, thank you so much for that. And speaking of cultural cooking classes, one of our Indigenous students just dropped me off a cooking feed that they just got back from their class today in made. So we're training them well already. They're already feeding me, which is good. Um, so thank you so much. I, I cannot thank you all enough for the time that you have given us uh, this evening to discuss this further. There are a couple of questions, a fair few actually. Um, and I think we'll ask a couple uh, and get to get to others at a later at a later stage. David, there's one in here specifically for you. Would you like to answer that at this time? Of course I would. Lovely. So um, this person said they'd specifically like to know Professor David, uh, Professor Caro's thoughts on this. If we can mandate student um, students to complete online courses such as Start Smart, surely at the very least, similar could be done could be um, introduced to ensure all students 
are educated on Indigenous history matters beyond cultural competency? Yeah, look, Tammy, I, I think there are a number of uh, areas where the university needs to think about uh, graduate competencies, uh, graduate knowledge uh, that transcend uh, individual programs. And I, that's obviously more difficult in, uh, in the vocationally uh, uh, directed programs. But uh, again, I think there has to be a commitment by the university to educate. And uh, that's not just about what people want to study, it's about uh, what people should have uh, by way of exposure. So I think there's a real opportunity here. And uh, we, we have talked about uh, uh, graduate attributes um, in many of the discussions since I've been at the university. And I think um, revisiting that uh, with the lens that we have tonight uh, is a critical part of, uh, of thinking about that future. You know, do we offer uh, a, a relatively standard program uh, across part of first year, for example, for everyone who comes to this university, no matter what they want to study? Um, and uh, if so, how will that help um, not only the university, but the community in which we live and the community which we serve uh, to, uh, um, to accelerate reconciliation? Can I just add that that should come through Indigenous studies as a discipline, because we all know that student numbers creates the cash that's required to hire people. And so having all these little outside courses and things that people go off to or putting the obligation onto community does not build capacity for Indigenous staff in Indigenous studies. And that's where the investment needs to go. So yes, people should be obliged to and should not be able to leave that university without coming through an Indigenous studies department some way to study a, a unit. That way you'd be able to build the Department of Indigenous Studies from the woeful amount of staff that it actually currently has into a proper department. It used to actually have some teeth to it. It used to have five or six staff members. And now you have, what, a couple at uh, three, but one of those I might add is on a contract. Um, and so not full-time permanent invest, vested into and not turn these individuals into teaching you know, hacks that you actually invest in their future as scholars. And so the more money that comes in via students with bums on seats would actually produce that. And I'm very, very much in support of, you know, having the knowledge of local folk come in, particularly elders and knowledge holders, but that, that is in paid positions. It's an, Wollongong University is an institution who doesn't say to people in law, oh, well, we won't pay some old people to come in and talk to you, but we'll get them because they know a lot. So it's just this kind of stuff just perpetuates it. So if you bring in elders, it has to be in paid positions to, you know, to share their expertise. But that shouldn't be at the cost of the investment in Indigenous studies at all. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. We've got time for one more question. Uh, so we've got from Adam Gowan. And sorry, that question before we just had. Sorry, I can't see the name up now. Um, it's on another screen, but I'll let you know who asked that question, David. Um, so this question I can answer, and it's regarding the inaugural RAP UAW announced in 2019. Can we get an update on how UAW went achieving the targets within the document and how the new aims in this 2022 to 24 document were devised? Thank you so much for that question. When I started here at UOW at the end, um, middle of last year, we'll say, I actually had a look at the wrap and we, we worked through whether things were achieved or not achieved. I worked closely with Jamie Beveridge and my predecessor, Joe Goulding on this. And we as a collective decided that we actually hadn't achieved as much as we'd like to. So we held ourselves back and remained at an Innovate wrap. So it's our second Innovate wrap. And you'll notice if you have a copy of the 2019 to 2021 wrap, you'll see a lot of the deliverables and actions have been transitioned across because we made a commitment to that, those actions and deliverables at that time, we felt like we needed to ensure that we moved forward and actioned those. So we did transfer them across to our new current uh, 2022 to 2024 wrap. So I hope that has answered your question and please reach out if you have any other questions on consultation of that of our reconciliation action plan and how we devised and developed that. So I want to thank all the guests uh, and, and everyone for taking the time out here 
to, to meet with us this evening. And we will be sure to try and, and include another event before the end of the year or a couple more events. And keep your eye on this space because we do have a whole week long of activities coming up uh, for Reconciliation Week. And there are definitely opportunities for our alumni and student staff community to get in on. Um, particularly there's a discussion, an extension of a, an allyship panel discussion led by Summer May Finlay. So uh, we're very lucky today to have some entertainment. We've got a traditionally inspired by country performance. So I'll get all our panelists. Thank you so much, our panelists, and, and, and I'll get you to turn off your cameras. And I'll just stay on for one second while I introduce Jaya King and Keena Brewer. So that it's traditionally inspired by country. Here we go, there's Jaya and Keena. So Jaya is a proud one year and pitta pitta man who grew up on the South Coast. Jaya is a second year student currently studying a Bachelor of Commerce majoring in management. He was taught to play the didgeridoo by his father, Mark, who runs the Didgeridoo Academy, an organization created to teach others how to play the didgeridoo and help First Nations boys and men become more comf confident, connected and empowered. Mark, Jaya's father, is a very well-renowned dig, uh, didgeridoo performer. And we thought we'd chuck in here who he also had the honor of playing for Nelson Mandela in 20, uh, 2000. Jaya has been performing since a young age and loves what he, what he brings to others and the, the way he makes people feel through his performances. So welcome and thanks, thanks Jaya. We've got Keena Brewer. Keena is a proud Wiradjuri woman who grew up in the Shell Harbour area. Keena is a second year student currently studying a Bachelor of Arts majoring in music. She's a singer songwriter and attended Oaks Flat High School. We thought we'd chuck that in to plug the high school for her before coming here to UOW. <laughs> Keena has been singing majority of her life and she loves to sing because she has so much to say and feels like she's truly listened and heard when she's performing. So thank you so much. I will leave you with this beautiful performance that's been traditionally inspired by country. G'day everyone, uh, Jai here. So I'm going to start off by playing a bit of Didge for you guys. Quick bit of context. This Didge is, um, I may have made some of it, but me and my dad worked on this when I was very, very young, about a toddler, and I've been playing it ever since. I've been playing since about very, very young age on stage since before that, and I love playing for all you guys. So I'll play a bit for years now. from me. 
Thanks, Claire. And now Keenan and I are just gonna I'm gonna sing a song for you guys. This song, whiskey. This is yeah. first time we've sung together, working together on this. Yeah, it's been good. It's been pretty fun. Um, yeah, this is Tennessee whiskey, and yeah, it's a duet. So hope you enjoy it. <laughs> Nights out in the back of a bar room. Like a word's the only thing I've known. But you're rescuing me from reaching for the bottle. You brought me back. Thank you so much. That was absolutely fantastic. And if I, if I don't believe you've only, you know, for a second that you've only just met and this is the first time performing together because that was just solid. Uh, so thank you. And um, thanks again to everyone and the wonderful panel that we had here. And I can see some of the comments coming through and we appreciate you. We appreciate your feedback and please reach out to us if you have any questions or if you'd like to discuss our reconciliation uh, journey here at UOW any further. Thank you. Good night. Yeah.